couple of words from the Athenaeum. We're really honored to be hosting this event in conjunction with uh, Dr. Rick Mehta. We believe wholeheartedly in the idea of rational discourse, that people should be allowed to present their opinions and have it percolated with equal vigor as a deferring one. And that as a society, we discuss these opinions no matter how abhorrent we find them. And that we separate the good from the bad. That is and always has been our belief as a student newspaper. And to the students in the community of Acadia, I want to say this. We are your paper. We have been for the better part of 140 years now. In that time, we've stuck with you through the greatness of your every success and your every failure. In every misstep, every uncertainty, and every triumph that came our way, we stuck by you. And we will always stick by you. We were there when you first had the courage to send us a poem you've always wanted everyone to read. Or when you wanted to protest the ills of society in the only way you knew how. We were there and we were listening. Today we stand in the midst of a great adventure. Will you join us? Right for the act. Uh, before I finish, I would like to introduce our first print issue for the year. We'll be handing these out after the talk ends, so please be sure to grab a copy. And this talk is going to be a bit lengthy. Rick, Rick has informed me that it's going to be 71 slides long. But stick by till the end. Uh, there's going to be a question period afterwards. And Rick will answer questions about free speech or maybe questions that you had about the slides. Great, Rick. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I guess the other thing that I will add is that I, have the, I will have the slides available as well as all the references that are read um, uh, to put the talk together and that's uh, 20 pages uh, worth of references and that's without going into MLA or APA format or anything like that. Right. Uh, so to start then, uh, universities have traditionally been venues in which all ideas can freely be exchanged. The underlying assumption has been that any idea, regardless of how controversial it is, can be discussed and scrutinized in an academic setting. By using tools such as discussion, debate, as well as data analysis and interpretation, poor ideas would be debunked and, de and discredited, while ideas with merit would flourish. The notion has been that society then benefits by adopting ideas that have been rigorously vetted, but still uh, as opposed to adopting ideas that may well be mainstream and widely accepted, but still incorrect and wrong. So as the saying goes, just because everyone uh, says something doesn't mean it's true. This whole process is based on the principle, principle of free speech. The notion that any idea, no matter how offensive or, or subversive it may be to mainstream society, can be expressed and discussed in an institution of higher learning. So there are five reasons why I'm arguing this position. So the first has to do with the question of how do we acquire knowledge about issues or have the capacity to solve difficult problems if we cannot talk about them. To quote from John Stuart Mill, he who knows only his side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may be able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as even know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Uh, so I'll, to give you an example of that, I'll give an example from a friend of mine, Paul McKenzie, and one of his experiences um, in his undergraduate experience. Uh, so in one of his classes, uh, they had a debate about whether or not women should get the vote, get to vote or not. And he had the thankless task of being on the side of trying to of debating that they should not get the vote. Uh, clearly a very distasteful position to have to argue. Uh, but afterwards, uh, when we talked about that, he said that he was better able to articulate why it is that women should be able to vote because he had to think of the other side. And that made him be able to better articulate exactly why that is. So, there is a, so that's one reason then about looking at a side even if it is offensive. Okay. Uh, the second is that uh, one of the, uh, what's happening in a lot of universities is the use of free, um, these um, speech codes. And so the second argue, argument that I'll mention is that Jeffrey Miller argues that the use of speech codes and other techniques that are used to suppress free speech actually work against the interests of neurodiversity. So what uh, neurodiversity uh, refers to then is people who have conditions like aut autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, bipolar disorder, or Tourette syndrome. So clearly in terms of the way their brain is organized is different from a typical brain. And so then the assumption here is when we use speech codes, we're actually imposing the rules of a typical brain onto people who have a neurotypical brain. And so then the argument 
Anthony Mays is how can we actually make the case that we're being inclusive as a, neuro, as a, as a university when we start imposing codes that work against the, um, the, 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 the ones who are not neurotypical. Right? Uh, the third is this notion of anti-fragility. Uh, so Jonathan Haidt, in his talks that are known on YouTube as Truth University versus Social Justice University and Coddling University versus Strengthening University, argues against the notion of universities being safe spaces. Okay? Instead, he argues for this principle known as anti-fragility. So it's the notion that uh, short-term exposure to ideas that make us uncomfortable actually make us stronger in the long term. So this is actually analogous to the way our immune system works when we have vaccinations or how we build muscle. Okay, so the idea is these systems work precisely because they are challenged. So actually I think I personally would take that idea one step further, that discomfort is actually a key component of any uh, meaningful change. So when you look at the health psych psychology literature, so one theme that seems to come up is that people need to reach this discomfort. I've had enough of the situation that now I'm willing to make a change, whether it's a change to my diet, whether it's a change to my exercise, maybe smoke, uh, ch no, stop smoking. And I think that we can also argue applies even to social change. People are uncomfortable with their situation, they say they've had enough, and that's what then instigates change. And so in a couple of minutes, I'm actually going to argue for something that's probably going to be very counterintuitive to many people, uh, which is that the idea that if we allow for people to express views that are offensive, this may actually play a role in instigating positive social change. Okay, so before I get to that, I did receive numerous requests to address the issue of hate speech. Uh, so I thought I'd turn to that uh, briefly. Uh, so the one issue is that Canada already has uh, hate speech laws. So according to the lawyer John Carpe, who founded the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, Canada already has healthy boundaries that make it illegal for any person to call for another person or group of people to be harmed in any way. And so these include robbery, assault, having their homes burned, or being killed. And so, because these protections are already in place, Carpe argues that universities should be safe spaces from assault or harm, but not from ideas that make people upset, maybe, maybe mostly because they agree with them or because they find them offensive. Okay. Uh, second is that suppressing hate speech actually does not suppress hate, which is the underlying problem. Okay, so uh, if you kind of think of a uh, uh, situation, so we have a student who's in the class and he says, well, maybe there are limits to this idea of white privilege. And so then other students get, a fa a fa you know, get really worked up about it, say you're a racist, you cannot say that. Uh, so if he cannot express that view in the university setting where there might be this uh, chance to maybe get some nuance to his idea where he might get changed on both sides. Instead, what's this person in goo? go into the underbelly of the internet and believe me, out there, what is, what's there is quite disturbing and this person is likely to become radicalized. So in essence, what we're doing there is taking a pot of boiling water, putting a, pot, um, putting a lid on it, and now we're well on our way to creating a pressure cooker. And so in terms of a talk along that lines, I'd recommend seeing the talk by Christina Brem in which she talks about her experiences uh, growing up in East Germany after World War II. Okay. Uh, then the third issue is, it's always easy for people who are in power to say, I have my, these concerns and that's why it, I think it's okay for me to tell you not to speak. Uh, but the issue that then that raises is, well, who should get to decide whose views can and cannot be expressed? And so I'll go through just briefly in history. It was not that long ago when we were living in the age of the uh, Harper Conservatives and we heard day in and day out about the muzzling of scientists. And so this actually went to quite extremes where he disliked anyone who said anything at all against the environment, including these bird watchers. So, you know, they're there to have some posters about the environment and so Revenue Canada came after them. Okay, so just one question, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when I use the example of the Harper Conservatives, uh, one of their tactics was to say, well, this issue is not up for debate. Okay, so we do want to agree then, I just want to see if we have agreement then that that is unacceptable as a tactic, if we want to be accountable for actions. Okay, so then next, we can look then, if we go further back in time, uh, for those of you who remember the 90s and early 2000s, uh, there was a scientist by the name of Sh uh, Shiv Chopra and throughout the 90s he gave the Liberal government of uh, Chrétien and Paul Martin a very difficult time uh, with issues related to our food supply. So for example, I, he argued against certain 
uh, hormones that they shouldn't be used in our milk supply. And so he was critical throughout the 90s. And then in 2014, uh, him and four other, and three other scientists argued, he wrote to um, Minister Anne McCallan, saying that we should not be using rendered beef, rendered uh, meat, uh, to feed to cows because that was going to increase the risk now of bovine spong spongiform encephalopathy or um, mad cow's disease. Uh, so those four scientists end up getting fired for that. Uh, so after that, one of them passed away. Eventually, two others got reinstated, uh, but now, 13 years later, the one person who is the most vocal is still fighting to get his job back. And so that's across three administrations now. So uh, the Martin government that fired him, uh, the Harper government that would not reinstate him, and continue now with the Trudeau government. Okay, and now we can go further, just a very recent case now. Uh, so what happened was uh, this, uh, there's this uh, a group called the Air Passenger Rights Network, and it's headed by Dr. Gabor Luka, Lukacs. And so what happened was uh, Dr. Lukacs published an article called Five Reasons Not to Trust the Can Canadian uh, Transport Agency, and then received two private messages over Facebook telling him to remove that message. And so the Justice Center of Constitutional Freedoms is now taking up his case. Uh, so clearly I think I could go on for ages, so unless we can decide who it should be, it's probably best to argue that no one should have that rule, because no one is actually above the law. And I guess related to this then, a point that I'll be building on later on, is that this is happening under the guise of the Trudeau government. And I'll just say that there are dark clouds behind these sunny ways. Right? Uh, so now, going back to the, where I wanted to go to, I want to introduce you to uh, Ruth Simmons. Okay, so Ruth Simmons was born in 1945 in Grapeland, Texas, where she was the youngest of 12 children. Uh, so one thing to note is that her grandparents were slaves, her great-grandparents were slaves, and she grew up in poverty during the Jim Crow era of uh, racial segregation. And so despite these challenging circumstances, uh, she attained uh, the top grades in her school and kept getting award after award until finally in 1995, sorry, she got a PhD in French literature from Harvard University. In 1995, she was the first African-American president of uh, Smith College, uh, which is a women's college in the US. And so in her role as president, she started both an engineering program and a finance program. So the rationale was that she wanted women to have access to the same high paying jobs as men. And then in 2000, she was appointed the first African American of an Ivy League university, so Brown University. And she started this position somewhere in the late, mid to late uh, 2001 uh, period. Okay, so now I ask you to put yourself in her shoes in terms of what happened when she got to the institution. Uh, so she's a descendant of slaves, and she's walking to the institution, and on the walls are pictures of former slave owners. Okay, so there's one, that's one aspect. And then before she arrived, there was a major controversy happening. So in March 2001, a writer by the name of David Horowitz had paid for a full-page argument uh, advertisement in the student newspaper that was titled, 10 Reasons Why Reparations for Slavery is a Bad Idea and Racist Too. And so the argument behind it was that slavery was a non-issue because it happened so long ago and it was that white Christians had ended it. And on top of that, he said that black Americans should be grateful for all the prosperity and freedom that they currently had at the US. Uh, so I'm hoping that you guys are with me in agreeing that these claims are actually offensive. Uh, but do you know how Dr. S uh, President Simmons handled that? Uh, she actually insisted that he come back, so she made sure that he was invited back to the university to speak, and she not only attended, but actually sat in the front row. So now we can fast forward to 2004, where she appointed a committee called uh, the Committee on Slavery and Justice to figure out how to deal with the institution's dark past. And the key co uh, concerns with her was she wanted to do it in a way so that all points of view could be expressed, and she wanted the problem to be solved. So in other words, she didn't want there to be endless grievances happening after the fact. Okay? And so I think based on this example so far, I would argue that when she allowed David Horowitz to speak, it gave her credibility in, in her cause because now people knew I could express whatever view I want and, and um, you know, I won't be uh, tarnished for it. And so now what I'll do is read some sequences uh, from a, a speech that she gave in 2004 at Smith College in which she reflects on her life experiences. And that's because I think what she says there probably has more applicability now than it might have even back in 2014. Right? So the first snippet then. My coming of age was marred by the wide acceptance of the violent suppression of speech. 
Any criticism or complaint that was deemed unsuitable could result in summary violence against one family, against one's family, and one's person. No forums of open expression existed for me or mine in the Jim, Jim Crow era, Jim Crow South of my early youth. Once you have tasted the bitterness and brutality of being silenced in this way, it is easy to recognize the danger of undermining free speech. Our founders began with a lofty ideal, holding certain truths to be self-evident. Little is self-evident self -evident in the public space today. Disagreement abounds on every slight and significant matter. Protecting free speech brilliantly insults us, insulates us from being silenced from our unpopular views. Okay, so that's sort of the one snippet I'll ask you to think about. Now, in the second part, uh, one's voice grows stronger in encounters with oppose, opposing views. My first year after leaving Smith, I had to insist that Brown permit a speaker whose every assertion was dangerous and deep, deeply offensive to me on a personal level. Indeed, he insisted that blacks were better off having been enslaved. Attending his talk and hearing his perspective was personally challenging, but not in the least challenging to my convictions about the absolute necessity of permitting others to hear him say these heinous things. I could have avoided the talk as his ideas were known to me, but to have done so would have been to choose personal comfort over a freedom whose value is so great to my own freedoms that hearing his unwelcome message could hardly be assessed as too great a cost. Right. And so now the third little snippet then. Universities have a special obligation to protect free speech, open discourse, and the value of protest. The collision of views and ideologies is in the DNA of the academic enterprise. Okay. And so in terms of my thesis from here is that while the DNA may not have changed at the level of the genotype yet, uh, we are seeing then through an epigenetic-like mechanism changes at the level of the phenotype. And so what I'll be doing from here then is going through examples uh, that have occurred over the last year alone of examples of suppression of free speech in England, US, and Canada. I'll then go into some of the contributing factors and I'll take up the case study of Everdeen State College because unless we make changes soon, uh, we're going in a direction where we're going to have the same kind of occurrences that are happening in the States now happening here at Acadia. And so then from there, I'll go into the issue of, well, how do we address the key issues which are of hate and looking for uh, solutions we can do here at Acadia. Okay. And so this list is definitely far from exhaustive. Uh, so just briefly what's happening in England now is that we have some universities actually mandating that students use gender neutral terms. So it's not encouraging to bring out the best of us, but actually making it uh, mandatory. And so Joanna Williams is one professor there arguing about how this violates um, um, academic freedom. Okay. Uh, and other universities actually banning certain newspapers because the idea is if we agree with, disagree with what these newspapers say, it must be fake news. And then some, I guess I'll just let this speak for itself. Uh, so there's one student group that's arguing that we should not do any cheering or whooping because that's dangerous to the uh, deaf people. Uh, so I guess I'll comment about that. It's just that uh, when you actually look at what's happening in England these days, so uh, with the Theresa May government, so due to her funding cuts, there's funding cuts to the, um, their health cut, their health care. So that's, of course, going to uh, disproportionately affect uh, young children and the elderly, the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, she had changed the building code laws, and those are thought to play a role in a fire that uh, killed people who were in, um, in a poor neighborhood. Um, as well, there was uh, cuts to the police services, and that's what we thought played a role in some of the incidents of terrorism that have arisen. So when you kind of think when there's these major issues that need to be solved, and this is the student's cause du jour. Okay, uh, so now I'll go to the U.S. And so here what I'll do is it's interesting seeing some of the interplay of what's happening both on the extreme left and the extreme right sides of the political spectrum, as well as some that have absolutely no no rational explanation. Uh, so in Pitzer College, an RA decided to send out an email to, the all, to all campus arguing that white, and so that's her word, white girls should not wear hoop earrings because this is cultural appropriation of uh, black culture. Okay, and so that I can relate to also then uh, incidents that have happened in Canada. So with uh, Nikki Ashton in, I think it was uh, March this year, uh, she puts a post up saying, uh, with, a, uh, with a Beyonce meme saying, to the left. And then she said for her um, Twitter post, you know, in line with environmental and social justice and economic justice causes, let's be like Beyonce and go to the left. 
Uh, she then uh, received uh, tweets then from Black Lives Matter saying this is cultural appropriation and ended up taking it down. So I guess the problem with the notion like cultural appropriation is that it's used so widely uh, that at this point it's almost losing its meaning even though it had a good meaning to start with. Okay, and so then uh, more recently there's been the incident at Millbury College, so where um, Alison Stanger uh, was just going to be agreeing to host, be, be on a panel uh, with Charles Murray, who was a controversial speaker. And so there the incidents got so out of hand that she ended up in a neck brace due to whiplash as well as a concussion. And then, of course, uh, there's the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where the protests due to Milo, Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos talks got so out of hand that there were bricks thrown, uh, fires, a lot of property damage, about $100,000 worth of uh, damage done. We were very fortunate that no one actually got killed in that uh, incident. Uh, so I guess people who are at me about, you know, talking about uh, addressing the issue of hate speech, I really wish that they had actually said something about the violence that occurred. And it's, I find it strange that when it comes to the groups like Antifa, which is short for um, anti-fascist, uh, that there's not enough of a crowd actually willing to actually denounce their violence. Okay, uh, so now this case I'm going to use is from uh, Laura Kipnis. Uh, so what's interesting about her, her case is just, just here, there just doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason for what's happening here. It's just people attacking each other for the sake of and doesn't seem to have the same political motivation. So to give you the background of Laura Kipnis, so she's a cultural critic and film professor. Uh, she's been labeled as a provocative feminist by The Nation, which is a leading liberal magazine. And so what happened in Laura Kipnis' case was that in, 20, in February 2015, she published an article in the Chronicle of Higher Learning called Sexual Paranoia Star, uh, Strikes Academe. And so basically what she was arguing was um, that there was problems with Title IX. So just to backtrack then. So in the U.S. they have uh, a, rule, a law called Title IX and it's to, uh, it's to put a ban on sexual discrimination in, in educational settings. So for issues like, for example, for sports as, a, as an example. And so what she'd argue in that article was that the use of Title IX was, it was being overused to go into the personal lives of faculty and of students. And so then after that, for having written that article, suddenly she found herself the target of a Title IX investigation. Uh, the basis being that her article had caused a climate of fear on the campus. And, um, and so then she was going to be investigated for that. Uh, so after a long ordeal, uh, she ended up um, being, um, uh, she was declared, I guess, innocent of those charges. They were let go. Uh, but now because the book was published, she went through yet another Title IX investigation on you know, sexual harassment. Uh, so in terms of what I'll read here, because oftentimes I think people argue that when it's, you talk about free speech, it's just people who are uh, right wing trying to argue for their cause. So I'm just going to read a couple of snippets from her book. So the reality is that the more universities devote themselves to creating these safe spaces, that new campus watchword, the more dangerous campuses have come for professors, and the less edu education itself becomes anyone's priority. Let me say that nearly every academic I know, this includes feminists, progressives, minorities, and those who identify as gay or queer, now lives in some fear of, uh, now lives in fear of some classroom incidents spiraling into professional disaster. Okay, uh, professors, even at major research institutions, universities, now routinely avoid discussing subjects in class that might raise hassles, hackles. A well-known well sociologist told me that he no longer lectures on abortion. I spoke to an Ivy League law professor whose students won't attend lecture about rape law. Someone who's written a book about incest in her own family described being con confronted in class by a student furious with her for discussing the book. A tenured female professor on my campus wrote about lying awake at night, worrying some stray remark of hers might lead to student complaints, social media campaigns, and eventual job loss. Okay, so the idea here is it doesn't seem to matter. I don't think it's an issue about left versus right or right versus left. It is just the general issue of intolerance. Uh, so I focus a bit on what's happening on the left side of the political spectrum. Uh, but we're also seeing some interesting developments from the right side. Uh, so more, most recent case is of uh, Chelsea Manning, so with Harvard University. Uh, she was invited to be a visiting fellow, so you just come in and for a day or two and give some talks. 
Uh, but what happened uh, after the invitation, once they were made public, was that there was denunciations uh, from people in the CIA as well as a resignation on campus. And so then Harvard then rescinded uh, their invitation. And so I think the tweets kind of speak volumes about uh, what she was thinking. Okay. And so in terms of what's happened now with uh, the suppression of speech happening from the left side of the political spectrum is that those on the right now have started developing uh, their, their own methods for retaliation. Uh, so one method that's been developed is de developing this website called Professor Watchlist. And so there people who are known to be liberal professors are put onto this, onto this website and it's this uh, group that are faceless who are deciding who's a, you know, a liberal and uh, you know, denouncing them. And so it's basically it's a, a star chamber that's being done online that's targeting liberal professors. Okay. And then uh, a more recent trend of what's happened uh, with the right side of the spectrum is they'll go after left-leaning professors based on their media tweets, so what they tweet on social media such as Twitter or Facebook. And so after the tweets are, 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 are public, uh, then you have magazines like Campus Reform or The College Fix that now report on these incidents. Uh, that make people on the right side of the spectrum quite irate. They then call for either resignations or death threats on the, from the professor. And so in some cases the universities uh, capitulate and then let them go. And so then that's bad for free speech. Uh, but then on the other side they are, they're still allowed to stay and that still creates a bitterness on a different side. So I'm just going to give you an example here then of what happened at uh, Trinity College. Uh, so we had a professor by the name of Johnny Eric Williams, and so he'd written messages on social media about what he claims were issues about racial issues and law enforcement in connection to a, uh, an officer's fatal shooting of black women in Seattle. And so in one of those posts, uh, he also shared an article by an anonymous author that was called Let Them Effing Die. And so basically what it suggested was that emergency uh, personnel should have left the wounded William, uh, victims of this con the congressional shooting that happened after that uh, baseball practice. Uh, so that's the one where Steve Scalise had uh, been shot. So he said they should have just died. Uh, so I'll just read you like a clip of, give you an idea of what, that, what was in that article. If you see them drowning, if you see them in a burning building, if they're bleeding out in an emergency room, if the ground is crumbling beneath them, if they're in a park and they turn their weapons on each other, do nothing. And so it just keeps continuing on like that for a while. And then finally the ending is let them effing die and smile a bit when you do. Okay, so that's basically the nature of the post that he had made. And so here it gives you an idea of what happened with his, what his posts looked like. And so he'd received death threats, he had, to, he had to leave town. Eventually the university decided to reinstate him while saying what that they, that what they he said was despicable. Uh, but that's, I think, is raising issues with people on the right side of the pe political spectrum saying, well, what if that had been a white person, would he still be here? So it just keeps creating this uh, circle then of uh, viciousness. Okay, and so this is just the latest, um, so I'm not gonna elaborate on it too much. This is just something that came up in the news lately, so of a, of a um, a professor who's teaching at a, you know, at a police college and he says I have this honor of teaching these future dead cops and needless to say that is not going over well uh, with the police commissioner or this, the, the mayor of New York. Right, so now I'll turn to uh, Canada because now we can, uh, so here what's happening is uh, that we're seeing more of what's happening on the left side of the political spectrum. Okay, so in terms of incidents that have happened, so we had uh, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, so they've tried to come to various campuses to promote their book, uh, Generation Screwed. And so there have been student groups at the University of Laval and Guelph University preventing them from coming there. Uh, so some saying, we don't like your brand of activism. Others saying, we didn't like your word screwed because that's rather offensive. Okay, uh, then at Mount Royal University, uh, the, the leader of the student uh, union uh, told a student to take off his uh, Trump hat because wearing the Trump hat is, makes him racist. Uh, so I guess when it comes to something like that is that if someone is a Trump supporter, it could be for a variety of reasons, so I think we often assume it must be because he likes him. Others could argue though it's in spite of what he said. Okay? And so here with the absence of information, how do you know without a discussion? Okay. Uh, so now we can look at the summer. So we had Guelph University uh, where a student group apologized uh, for playing Lou Reed's song, Take a Walk on the Wild Side, uh, because it was transphobic, so they apologized for that. 
and then they had to retract their apology because it was an error. So basically the song, uh, the, the song who was about Holly Woodlawn, uh, she actually said that, you know, Andy Warhol might have made me famous, but you've made me immortal. So the ones who complained end up being the ones who look foolish, as did the student group for having made the apology in the first place. Okay. Uh, then at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University, uh, so we have this cafe owner, Sandor uh, Dossman. Uh, so he's in the situation where he's looking for a new employee. He puts out an ad and it's not working. Uh, so he decides to put an ad out based on the hipster stereotype. So we'll accept people with man buns, you know, tattoos are fine. We're going to give low wages, that kind of thing. Uh, but he ends up being fired because the word slave was used in the ad. Uh, so. So people, and it wasn't even by people in the community being offended. So basically, he started having lots of uh, submissions that he didn't before, um, but just that the student group that actually owned the cafe decided it was offensive and ended up firing him. Uh, the other incident that I had with Wilfrid Laurier University is that Danielle Robitaille uh, was supposed to give a talk there. So for those of you who don't know who she is, uh, she got her. Uh, law degree from Dalhousie and while she was there she won the Muriel Duckworth Award for raising consciousness of women's issues and feminism in the legal community. Uh, so she was supposed to give a talk about what it's like being a, whim, a woman in the legal profession uh, but uh, they ended up having to cancel the talk due to security concerns because people got into an uproar because she was one of the lawyers who had defended Gian, Gian Gomeshi. Okay. Uh, so in terms of where we have a real hotbed of uh, the suppression of free speech happening is at Ryerson University. Uh, so in terms of uh, one case that made viral was that of Jane Matthias. Uh, so she was taking a sociology class and she wanted to write a paper on the wage gap. And so she emails her professor about that and is told, well, you can use only feminist sources. And so in the course outline, there was even more stipulations about what, we, you know, what you could use. So she said, you cannot use uh, newspaper articles. You cannot use data from the Government of Canada website because you guys don't have the skills to read those numbers and interpret them for yourselves. You can only use uh, feminist sources. And the, you know, then when the student emailed, she said, you know, the patriarchy is real, glass ceilings are real, so this is what you need to do. Uh, so in response to that then, uh, her sister Josephine then launched her My Name is Josephine you, you know, YouTube page. And so in that she talks about the wage gap and how she thinks it's a myth. And then she says, well, if you want to quote a feminist, well, I'll quote one. Here's Christina Hoff Summers. And so with Christina Hoff Summers, she has a page, YouTube page, as well as books that she's written. So with the YouTube page, page it's called The Factual Feminist. And there too, she talks about how she believes that the wage gap is a myth. And so it seems like when it comes to that issue, it seems to be an issue that's real on university campuses. Uh, but if you read anywhere else, they'll always argue that the gap is either much smaller than it's purported to be or even non-existent. So here's one example just from July. Uh, this year saying why it's, top, it's time to stop worrying about this in, first, in the first world problem, first world uh, countries. Okay, uh, so in terms of other issues then, uh, there was a male issues, male issues awareness society and what's kind of interesting about those groups is oftentimes, uh, so in this one, there's actually more women than men in this group. At other ones, they're actually a 50-50 mix, uh, but they were denied club status at Ryerson. And then most recently there was a cancellation of a panel discussion which strangely enough was called the stifling of free speech on university campuses. And so what's uh, ironic about that apart from the cancellation of the based on the title, is that uh, one of the people, Gad Saad, so he's a professor of marketing and a research chair in evolutionary behind behavioral sciences and Darwinian consumption at Concordia University. Uh, so with him, he's actually a Jewish refugee from Lebanon who per, per, uh, you know, escaped religious persecution. And someone like him is being called a white supremacist just because he's arguing for the notion of free speech. Okay, uh, so my wonder then what is actually happening here. Okay, and so this is an article that I found rather um, and compelling. So what had happened here, so during the Harper era, uh, when the issues were about the environment, uh, we had the groups like the Canadian Association of University Teachers uh, being very active in um, countering uh, the Harper government and what was uh, saying. Uh, but more recently, with all the other cases that have happened, it seems interesting that there's been uh, this silence. So the only time they've actually said anything thus far that I know of is on the cancellation of the panel discussion. But with all the other incidents, they've been curiously silent. And one, one might wonder why that is. And so 
got some insight from Deborah So. So she's a researcher in sexual neuroscience. And so in this article here to the Golden Mail, she explains why she decided to abandon the academia and the idea is that it's so stifling that it's hard to actually uh, get your work done. And so here she actually talks about what actually is happening behind the scenes. So for example, in my field of sexology, even if academic researchers have tenure, they will avoid particular areas of study completely, such as the topics of gender dysphoria in children or biological sex differences in the brain because they know their professional and personal reputations will be at stake if their findings aren't socially palatable. It is also often the case that academics cannot interact with the media without explicit approval from their institution. As a result, the mainstream discourse suffers because only, in quotes, experts touting politically correct messages are heard. This results in a bias in information that is available to the public and further indoctrination of a generation of students who are already shielded from dissenting views. Okay, so basically this, what's, this is suggesting then is that this is very similar to what we had during the um, Harper years uh, where we had the suppression of scientists, but this is now happening uh, within the university setting. Okay, and so then one might wonder then how do we actually kind of get at something like this uh, when it's something you can't really ask about. So the best way I think to actually get at this issue is actually to see what happens to people who actually do speak out on this issue. And so the one who's probably the most uh, famous for that uh, would be Jordan Peterson. And so I'll be coming at this from a slightly different angle from what you might have seen in the media, which is actually looking at um, the way he has been treated and actually looking at the mechanics. The only place that any of uh, his um, uh, trials and tribulations have been reported have been in the National Post with very little in the uh, more liberal media. Uh, so I guess I'll just ask you, when it comes to a debate, if this sounds reasonable in terms of what to expect. So we might have a moderator. We'll have someone who's in favor of a position, someone who's opposed. And so then we allow them both to speak and the moderator tries to make sure that there's uh, you know, equal time for both sides of the issue. Uh, and then afterwards open up the, uh, the questions to the audience so that anyone can come up to a mic and ask their question. Does that sound like it's a reasonable approach? Okay, so now we'll look at what actually happened on the debate on Bill C-16 that happened at the University of Toronto on November 19th of last year. Uh, so in case you, uh, basically what the gist of Bill C-16 is, uh, was that the government was going to add gender identity and gender expression uh, to the Human Rights and Criminal Code. And, and so Jordan Peterson was opposed to that. So that's sort of the brief version. Uh, so in terms of what we had then is Jordan Peterson, who's opposed, not against one person, but against two. And so one thing I'll just mention in terms of what seems to be the theme coming up over and over again when it comes to the suppression of free speech is that it's done under the guise of social justice and the terms that keep coming up over and over again are going to be ones like equity, diversity, inclusion. So kind of like those seem to be the buzzwords. Okay, so we have Jordan Peterson up against Brenda Cosman and Mary Bryson. And what's kind of interesting about their opening remarks is that Brenda starts off by saying, I commend all the people who are banning this event today. And with Mary Bryson saying, these issues are not up for debate. Okay, so earlier we argued about the Harper government. So if it's unacceptable then, I'm gonna argue, it's also unacceptable now. Okay, so now we have the moderator who's Mayo Moran. And so, if Norm, so instead of the debate going back and forth, what happened was, uh, Jordan Peterson would argue his position, and then one of those two, um, Brenda or Mary, uh, would do a rebuttal, but then Jordan did not get a chance to respond. And so that was the format for this entire, in quotes, debate. And then at the end, when it came to questions, uh, those are ones that were taken in by the committee at the front, and they decided what questions would be asked. So it wasn't like the audience had a chance to ask any questions on that. And so I think when I describe a situation like that, one might start to get a little suspicious about what's actually happening behind the scenes. Okay, so fast forward now to January 2017. So uh, the Running Meat Society at Queen's University uh, wanted to hold a debate on C-16. And so they went to six professors in their faculty of law and not one of them wanted to debate Jordan Peterson. Uh, so in the end, what ended up happening was Bruce Party, so someone who was actually on the same side as Jordan Peterson on this issue, said, okay, well, I'll volunteer and step up and I'll just play devil's advocate. And so if you like, you can watch that debate. Okay, so now we'll fast forward now to uh, March uh, 2017 at McMaster University. Uh, so there, there was supposed to be a panel discussion on free speech and political correctness in academic settings. And so it was supposed to be with uh, three panelists. 
Uh, so two of them end up dropping out uh, due to emails that they received before the event. And then on the day of, one of them dropped out because of security concerns. So that ended up just being Jordan Peterson in a room like this. And then there are all these uh, protesters there screaming at him, transphobic piece of, and, and so he's tried for an hour to get through and the event ended up being canceled. And so in terms of who was uh, favoring this then, was the McMaster University Presidential Advisory Council Committee on Building an Inclusive Community. Uh, so basically in their statement they had before was that the, the biology on this, they, there's no role for biology, this issue is already solved. Uh, so there's no room, no need to debate that. And then that was followed by Patrick Dean's message uh, saying that uh, you know, this was just a peaceful protest. So basically I'll just kind of, you know, saying that, that what had happened was okay. And so the next one, in terms of a disturbing trend that I think is happening in the country, is actually racial segregation. Okay, so University of Toronto is now starting to follow the same trend that we're seeing at universities in the U.S. Uh, we're having uh, racial segregation where we're having, for example, like here, a black graduation ceremony. So it's one that's happening in the U.S. And so that was requested here at the University of Toronto. And so the university was quickly on board with that request and contributed funding. And so the person who was so enthusiastic about that was Kelly Hannah Moffitt, the Vice President of Human Resources and Equity. Okay, so basically an argument behind that is that a lot of the words uh, that seem to sound rather uh, benign have a much darker meaning in terms of what they say and what they mean are two different, are two different scenarios. Okay. Uh, so now coming into Acadia University, uh, so in terms of issues that have happened here, so over the summer we actually had a doxing here by the alt-right. So doxing uh, refers to the, uh, um, the uh, giving out of personal information online without people's permission. And so basically what had happened was, we could, we could started, so I basically looked at the Twitter feed for the group that had done this. And so it can trace back to the uh, protests that happened on Canada Day about uh, the Cornwallis statues. Uh, so most of the media had really blown that as if, uh, you know, as if it was a major uh, inc violent incident that had occurred. So the only one that was a little bit more calm was Christy Blatford, uh, where she said that, you know, they might have been idiots, but nothing actually happened beyond that. And so if you watch the video, you can decide for yourself. Uh, so basically there was just a conversation then between the members of the Proud Boys and the Native activists. And after that, Antifa had doxed the Proud Boys, so that leads to them being, uh, um, uh, getting uh, disciplined by the military. And so then this alt-right group gets angry about that and decides to uh, dox uh, multiple people. And so the ones that uh, were included were members of our community. Uh, so it included our LGBTQ activists, uh, some students, as well as a faculty member. And so it seemed to me the reason was either they were part of a community or they had self-identified as feminists. And so my fear here is, of course, that it doesn't escalate from there, but it seems like things have calmed down since. Uh, so in terms of what my comment earlier about activism is that I think when we have the activism on issues related to the statues and when that gets all the media attention, uh, then we tend to lose focus on what I think are probably the more uh, pressing issues. So when you kind of think that what's happening in some of our communities that even two years into the Trudeau government being in power, uh, they still don't have drinking water. And we still have Cindy Blackstock. Uh, so she. Uh, has been arguing for having child services in Northern Ontario. And so uh, the court has told the government it's time to actually act, but instead of just going along with that, uh, they're still fighting that court case. Okay, so I guess that's where I think we should be focusing our efforts probably more so than on the statues. Okay, uh, so in terms of uh, my own impressions then about what's happening here at the university, uh, so a number of students have told me that they feel uncomfortable voicing their opinions in their classes or expressing their views on campus uh, because of their fear of being ostracized. Uh, so I think one way we could actually get around this is the use of what's called the fearless speech index and that might actually get us some actual uh, data on this issue. Okay, uh, so in terms of uh, faculty then, uh, so when I sent out a, an open letter to the Acadia community in August, uh, so the, uh, it was silent in terms of what was actually on the, on the email list, on the email serve, but I got numerous calls from both faculty and staff who had thanked me for the message that I sent, and a large part they were saying that's because I'm afraid to speak out for myself. And so, interestingly, when I emailed the campus with details about the talk that I was doing uh, today, 
all the, the ones that were supportive of me were coming in privately, where the ones where people were claiming to be oppressed were the ones that were going out for the public feed. Okay, and so it often feels then that a number of campus that can't be discussed on campus, uh, there, that there are a number that you just cannot talk about in a campus setting, even though there's lots of discussion I can have either in, you know, outside of the, the university bubble or in online places like, uh, like uh, con the social comments on a, on a social media. And so in terms of other things that seem to be happening on campus is that we seem to have this un, you know, uncritical approval of anything that's related to social justice. Uh, so it seems like there's a lack of uh, political diversity if you just walk around on campus and see what there, what there is for talks. So you'll see lots of talks from the Canadian Council on Policy Alternatives, uh, but you don't see too many talks, let's say, from the Canadian Taxpayer Federation or from... Um, or from, let's say, the Phaser Institute. Or if it's from um, someone from the trans community, it's always from the left side, so I won't hear from someone like, let's say, Taryn Meyer or Blair White. And what seems to be rather interesting then, when it comes to uh, different points of views, is how people are readily parenting, parroting uh, just these lines and slogans. Uh, so I remember there was uh, the line, because it's 2015, uh, cited at a convocation uh, for science of all places. Uh, so if you kind of think about it, you wouldn't be able to just use because it's the current year as a logical argument for something else. I mean, try getting out of a parking ticket with that, it is not going to work, right? And I've seen numerous emails coming in saying, because diversity is our strength. So again, just sort of this meaningless slogan. And that's curiously enough from faculty members. So if I was going to say something, it's our strength. It's our, maybe our ability to reach consensus, even though we have differences of opinion. That, to me, would be a strength, but not diversity just for the sake of. And so I remember last year when uh, Justin Trudeau went on, you know, was at the UN and talking about how he's a feminist. And that just got viral and just really spread like wildfire. Uh, but I find that interesting given his record when it comes to selling arms to the Saudi Arabia, uh, given that they don't really have the greatest records when it comes to human, you know, women's rights. So it's finally today that they get the, you know, the right to drive. Okay, and it's been rather interesting comparing the campus during the Harper years, comparing now to the Trudeau years. So during the Harper years, it seemed like he could not do the single slightest thing without having some criticism. Uh, but now during the Harper years, sorry, the Trudeau years, it just seems like suddenly there's a silence, even though in my, my argument is going to be that his record is actually quite abysmal. Uh, so we just kind of look at broken promises, the ones on uh, what our debt would look like or propor proportional representation. There's also then the issue of the Phoenix payroll system. So you have employees who've been working there who still haven't been paid. And I think two years on, it's probably a little bit overkill now to say that that's Stephen Harper's fault. I've also been surprised that there's been minimal protests over the CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. Uh, so that's gone through with almost minimal protests. And I'm not sure if you know this, but your price of prescription drugs is about to go up in seven years. Uh, so if you kind of think of what happens usually um, when it comes to political power, usually their shelf life is either eight or 12 years, so three or four terms. So about seven years on from now, that's either going to be as the liberal government is going to be petering out anyway, or there's going to be someone else in power who's going to take the blame for that. And so in terms of other issues then, in terms of why I'm worried about the future of our country, is that I made big promises related to the uh, murder and missing indigenous women, and there's been little progress on that. So there's been on the one hand that issue, uh, where there's going to be uh, anger amongst the indigenous community. Uh, but outside of the community, though, there's going to be anger because there are a lot of people saying, well, why are we spending this money uh, when we probably already know the answers that's not going to tell us much anyway. So that's going to be uh, a cause of social unrest. Uh, within the indigenous community, there's been groups advocating to have uh, and expand the inquiry to men. Uh, so one of their arguments that there's actually more men who've been affected than women, uh, but the answer has been a consistent no. Okay. Uh, so the other reason now I'm uh, worried now about gender relations is that now we had a, a budget uh, where the preamble was that when we have a budget, it differentially affects men and women, so in very different ways. Uh, but then after that, the focus is exclusively on women. And so you can imagine then what's going to happen then when you have a large group of males who are feeling excluded from the political system. Okay, and then add to that now, that now that what they want to do is suppress debate. So again, going to that issue, is it acceptable or not when we say we are not going to suppress, when we're not going to have a debate. 
Okay, and so what I find interesting throughout all this, with all the issues I've raised, is that when it came to like the Jordan Peterson debate uh, and what's happened with him, it's been the surprising absence or the silence now from Couch. So during the Harper years, we heard endlessly from them. Uh, but it seems apart from that one issue with the, uh, with the, uh, the one cancellation of that one uh, panel discussion, there's been relative silence there. Uh, so just in terms of other now disturbing trends, is that in the states now from a survey, the vast uh, students there, is it acceptable uh, to, uh, to shout down speakers? And so main thing here is somewhere between 40 to 60% of people said it's yes, and that's across the political spectrum. And then asked if is it okay to use violence if you disagree with the speaker? And that's roughly 20%. Uh, so when you think these people are going to be your future lawmakers, that is actually a very disturbing finding. Uh, so that's one from just uh, the states last week. Uh, so a little while back, earlier this year, uh, there was a study that's done, so a really large-scale survey. Sorry. Pardon me? Oh, okay. So this is actually a fairly large-scale survey done across, the, across numerous countries. Uh, asking uh, young people their views on different issues. And so generally what we see here then is that people are supportive when it comes to gender equality, transgender rights, uh, abortion, and even same-sex marriage, so really high approval there. Uh, but what they disapprove of though is anything that would offend people who are in religious minorities or who are in visible minorities. And I see that as a dangerous trend as someone who actually is a visible minority because basically that gives me this uh, protected status that others don't have. And that's something that some have argued is called uh, vic um, weaponized victim victimization. And so I have this protected status where then I can use that against someone else with relative impunity. So I'll give you a recent example of this um, is what happened in the States as they had a professor by the name of Beverly Wilkins who started in 2001. Uh, in 2007, a black professor by the name of Letitia Smith started, and over the three, course of three years, she got uh, promoted to assistant dean and then dean. And then in 20 D, 2010, uh, Smith dismissed Wilkins because she said, well, we have budgetary cuts and so we, I can't keep you. Uh, but then she ended up hiring someone who en ended up earning $15,000 more uh, than uh, than Wilkins. And then on top of that, when they investigated further, they noticed that almost all the people who were let go were white, except for one person. Okay, so this is just, and that's why there was a lawsuit for uh, $5 million of discrimination. So key idea I'm making here is that if we have the same rules, it should apply for everyone. We shouldn't have a special status based on uh, things like our ethnicity or religion, and just because that would offend someone. Uh, so in terms of the modern social climate then, Uh, so basically what's happening these days, uh, there's been large changes in terms of how we communicate. So before we used to have print media and we'd get different sources that would arrive and we'd at least be able to debate different points of view. Uh, but these days we get our, our, our information from the internet. And so in terms of how we get the news is it's often filtered for us. We can decide what we want to get for ourselves. As well when it comes to our friends we can minimize our interactions with people who, with whom we disagree. And so that kind of changes the way we've been communicating. And so this uh, picture, I think, shows nicely what's happening here. So it's basically looking at the blogospheres in the states of people who are the Republicans and the Democrats. And basically what this is showing is that they're living in their own little worlds that are separate from one another. Okay, uh, so another trend. So this is something I've been thinking about for years, but, um, uh, but there hasn't been data until recently on this. Uh, so in terms of what I've been worried about is that when it comes to, is that over years, uh, as a species, we've always had this tendency to separate the world into us versus them. And so in the past, there have always been issues like, let's say, race or gender or, you know, sexual orientation. So those are ways we could separate ourselves into us being, you know, morally superior, having good qualities, all uh, being different from one another, and them being having these inferior qualities and being all the same. And so the worry I've always had is, are we using viewpoints in that same sense? And so now a recent study actually suggests that that is what is happening. Uh, so I'll just go through a study just to kind of show you uh, evidence for this. So this was published uh, earlier this year. So basically what they did was they had the scale of uh, ethnic tolerance. 
And so what you do is you'd rate different statements on a scale of like one to nine. And so you'd say you're highly tolerant if you agree with statements like, let's say, the first ones, the values, ways of life, and customs of other cultures are probably just as good as my own. And then if you disagree with statements like this one, the world would be a much better place if all other cultures and ethnic groups modeled themselves on my culture. So basically high on the one end and low scores on that other one. And so that's how you can get an idea of quantifying how ethnic, how, uh, ethnic tolerance people are. Okay, so what's good about these set of studies, what I find convincing is that these were actually done with community samples and not just student groups, so they're a bit more representative of the population. Uh, so in the first study they did is a paper and pencil test. And so everyone was given the uh, scale of ethnic tolerance. Uh, then afterwards they were given a statement uh, either advocating for or against the mandatory detention of asylum seekers. And then apart from rating the statement, they were asked then, uh, would you accept or reject the person who had made that statement? And so there was um, more like in the sense of being a friend or a neighbor versus uh, to intimate relationships like a lover. Okay. Uh, so what they found then was the people that scored high on this, the scale of ethnic tolerance, so as you'd expect, they'd be more likely to reject the people who are in favor of mandatory detention. Uh, but what was counterintuitive though here is that they're also willing to reject that person in both intimate and non-intimate uh, relationships. So it's not that I just reject that argument, I reject you as a person for advocating that. And that's something you don't see on the people who are low for ethnic tolerance. So they might have uh, you know, they, might, they might have rejected the statement, but they didn't reject the person. Okay, and so now we see the same kind of findings. So in the second study, uh, they asked about this in the context of political intolerance. So would you vote for someone who had these views? And so here then they said, you know, they agreed with statements saying these kind of people should be banned from public office. And they also scored high on this test of uh, prejudice for those, for those people. And again, that's something we didn't see on the group that actually was uh, low on this ethnic tolerance scale. Okay, so that was done in Australia. Uh, so now they did a third study, and this was now to replicate it in the US in the context of just looking at the finding on prejudice. Uh, so this was an online study, and here they replicated the main finding, and they corrected for political ideology. So, it hadn't, it, uh, so you can rule out that they were doing this just because they were on the liberal end of the political spectrum. Then in study four, they now did the same study again in the UK. So you're seeing this in three different countries. And so now for this one, what they want to do is try to figure out what it is that's happening. Is it due to people's moral convictions or does it have to do with uh, their sense of identity in terms of how we talk about that term of identity politics? Okay, so with the, this part of here, what's showing is our variables. So ethnic tolerance and then how prejudiced you would be. And so the scale that I'll use is a scale of zero to one. And so the stronger the number, the stronger the relationship, and that could be either positive or negative. So in terms of relationship between ethnic tolerance and prejudice, is about 0.41 on this scale of zero to one. Okay, and, and that's just by itself. But that decreases to 0 0.08 uh, once we start including the other variables, so the ones of, eth of uh, moral convictions and identification. So we can look at the moral conviction side. So there does seem to be a relationship between ethnic tolerance and moral conviction, uh, but that is not a predictor of prejudice. So that doesn't seem to be what's happening. So we can now look at the side of uh, identification. So what seems to be happening here then, uh, the more ethnically, ethnic tolerance you have, that means you're less likely now to identify with someone that you view as intolerant. And that strength of that uh, connection is about negative 0.5. So it's pretty moderately strong. And so now the less you identify with that person, now the more likely you are to exhibit prejudice against this person with a different point of view. And that's a pretty strong um, value there. So almost minus 0.7. Uh, so basically that's saying then that if we see someone with a different point of view, we see them as an outgroup. And so now we're more likely now to dislike them on that basis. And so these studies, they were done between 2010 and 2014. And so I think this is before we had any, you know, before things got even more heated. And these were community samples. So I think these relationships would probably be even more strong if it was, let's say, in an activist community uh, where, the, where the views are even more polarized. And so I think this would argue then that this probably preceded then the events that we've seen in the, in the States as opposed to people arguing that it's the events that happened in the States that's calling the, causing the polarization now. And so this one is a little more personal, which has to do with uh, how, the, how we approach activism. Uh, so I guess uh, 
Uh, in terms of when I was growing up, probably the person who I idolized as a kid and who I really wanted to emulate uh, as an activist uh, was Mohandas K. Gandhi. Uh, so as a kid growing up, it was you know when it was off, you know often being isolated, being the only brown child in a in a you know in the elementary school setting, feeling really out of place when you're not only the brown one but the one who's overweight socially, you know socially you know. Uh, without any social skills and no athletic ability or anything like that. So it's hard to find a role model you could look up to. Uh, but I remember when I was at the age of 10 and I discovered Mohandas K. Gandhi and the Mahatma. So what um, inspired me about him uh, was that, of course, he was in, there in India with the British rule. Uh, but he didn't want to approach uh, them the way a Marxist would. So the idea was they are oppressing us, uh, but they are not evil in and of themselves. So he, he, his goal was he wanted them to see the errors of their ways, not just throw them out. So he wanted them to actually appreciate that what they are actually doing is wrong. So it's that separation between the person and the action. And so he ultimately wanted them to notice that what they're doing is wrong and, and then end up leaving. And he wanted them to leave as friends. And so another thing his, um, yeah, he aspired to was to have a country where everyone would be able to get along with each other uh, despite their differences. So his view is that when it came to these, um, when it came to uh, spirituality, we might have different, uh, different paths, uh, but our destination is the same. So he tried to look at what was sort of the inherent goodness in people and aspire to bring out the best in them. Uh, so when I see about the activists these days, it always, I always find it uh, disheartening uh, to see them with their signs and screaming at people. And with the modern activism, it seems that where, where it's, uh, what's happening is it's these people who are self-selected. They decided, I'm going to be a representative of my community, and I'm going to do things my way. And so then they scream at people. Uh, people then, of course, are fearful of them and might give in to their mans. Uh, but meanwhile, in terms of the rest of the community, it seems to be silent. Uh, but every once in a while, you'll re-hear from someone, uh, and when they speak, it's actually quite interesting what they actually do have to say. Uh, so this is now from the student, Natalie Bao Tram Lee, uh, so who's a student at Harvard. And so this is a portion of, uh, from her letter to the Harvard Crimson. So I shared the same LGBT demographic with the protesters that stood and held up fight transphobia signs, but they do not speak for me, especially as they fringe upon free speech and expression. Being part of a protected class does not give us the privilege or right to shut down speech just because we do not like what we hear. As a demographic whose cause is founded on tolerance and acceptance, we are hypocritical for su supporting PC culture. What the protesters are doing is selfish. They're pushing their own agenda in hopes of, of um, preventing people, including a female minority like me, from being exposed to differing opinions that challenge them to think critically. Furthermore, the fact that they and many other college protesters equate speech with violence is concerning, since this logic can easily be used to excuse tactics that encroach on people's free speech. Okay, and so then we see the same kind of thing now with uh, this letter, uh, this article that was published in the CBC uh, about uh, Black Lives Matter. So what um, this individual, Orville Lloyd uh, Douglas, has to say then uh, when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement is that, so basically what happened was Black Lives Matter, uh, because of their protests, uh, the police end up uh, not um, participating in their uniforms. And so he, he actually denounces that and said, well, in this, um, in this article saying, well, actually the police have you know, apologized for past transgressions. They're actually making headway within our community and are trying to make amends for the past. Uh, but meanwhile, we have events like the, the Caravana and there it's supposed to be an event for the black community, but there there's open homophobia and Black Lives Matter is doing absolutely nothing about that. And so in the end there, he's saying, these people do not speak for me. Okay. Uh, so in terms of trying to figure out where it is then, so I've often wondered where it is then that people would get this idea that it's okay to actually go out and start, um, you know, and start uh, you know, protesting and making demands like that and saying my way is the right way. And so I started getting some ideas um, about a year ago. So, uh, so about a year back, so in August of this year, last year at this time, uh, the University of Chicago uh, put out um, a letter to all students. Uh, about academic freedom. And so the first paragraph, so I'll just uh, read here. So uh, what it was saying there is that, um, so we had a faculty report on freedom of expression. And so it says, members of our community are encouraged to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn without fear of uh, censorship. Civility and human respect 
and, and mutual respect are vital to all of us. And freedom of expression does not mean the freedom to chant, to harass, or threaten others. Uh, you will find that we expect members of our community be, to be engaged in rigorous debate, discussion, and even disagreement. Okay? And so at times this might cause discomfort. Uh, so I think this is in line with what I tried to do in the class, is just the idea of we try to have a respectful uh, discussion. Uh, we hope to get someone else to come to our side. Uh, but in the worst case scenario, maybe the best we can do is agree to disagree. Uh, so the second paragraph was about safe spaces and uh, trigger warnings. So to put the context, I think here I cringe a little bit because of how he had actually worded it. So with the trigger warnings, the issue that's happening in the U.S. is that uh, some of the universities are mandating it. And so here at the University of Chicago, they're saying we are not going mandate to mandate it, but professors can use them if they wish. And so with the safe spaces, uh, what was happening in the U.S. is that if there was a controversial speaker, uh, what some of the universities would do would have this uh, puppy room where people could play with puppies and Play-Doh and have crayons. So that's what he was referring to there, is that we're not going to have space, safe spaces like that just because you disagree with a speaker. Uh, so it does come across as condescending, I think, the way he worded it, but he was addressing a serious issue there. And so then the last part is uh, fostering the free exchange of ideas reinforces a, a related university priority. So building a campus that welcomes people of all backgrounds. And so this is what's interesting here when we talk about diversity. So now here he says diversity of opinion and background is a fundamental strength of our community. So the members of our community must have the freedom to espouse and explore a wide range of ideas. So we can contrast what's said here with the way we're kind of talking about diversity at our institution. Okay. Uh, so what I found interesting then was the faculty uh, was the response that came. Uh, so basically here what you're saying is you have a faculty that endorsed, um, endorsed the Chicago uh, principles. Okay. Uh, but then there was a letter of protest. Uh, so I'll just go to the ending section here. Okay, so here we have then the best basis for independent thought and action may be those that you create for yourselves. So now, for example, graduate student instructors at the University of Chicago have won the right to organize a labor union. So please see the statement of University of Chicago chapter of the uh, American Association of University Professors for further evidence of widespread faculty support of student activism and student rights. So that's very different from uh, what was said in the original report. So sort of backtrack what had happened was, so when this first came out last August, so what I expected to happen uh, was that this was a major uh, trend happening at the University of Chicago. I assumed then it would be communicated to our American counterpart, the American Association of University Professors, and that that would then in turn get communicated to Couts, or the body representing uh, our academics. Uh, so the reason for that was that's how I actually learned about Professor Watchlist was through uh, the Cout Bulletin. And so this was a major issue because I was seeing it in my news feed uh, constantly around that time last August. Uh, but months came by and still nothing, nothing seemed to happen and something seemed rather strange about that. Okay? And so basically here what's happening is they're, they're saying that this is widespread faculty report, support and so is the University of Chicago. And so the key thing about the, uh, here then, is that the uh, American Association of University Teachers then, is that they're not referring to all faculty, but specifically to unionized faculty, which is one subset of the larger group. Okay, so that's uh, the one issue. So in terms of how unionization differs in the states versus Canada, uh, so in the states, if you join a union, it's optional. So, yeah, you can just choose whether you want to be in one or not. So you have a choice in the matter. Uh, whereas in Canada, uh, it's mandatory. So if I'm part of a unionized faculty, uh, then I have to be a member regardless. So if I withdraw my membership, my, my dues are still drawn no matter what. So that's a key issue here then. Uh, so here what's, when they're saying that they're referring to widespread faculty support is specifically of the subgroup that was from the University of Chicago. And so what they're saying is that we actually oppose then what's in the uh, University of Chicago principles. Uh, so if that's what they oppose, then we might wonder what it is that they do support. Okay? And so then the next statement is, the right to speak up and make demands is at the very heart of academic freedom and freedom of expression generally. Okay, so I find that rather compelling. So which one is this more in line with, with protesters uh, going out with signs or more with the idea of civilized debate or civilized discussion? Okay, and so now, I'll just kind of backtrack here. 
so basically here, the, what was, so here they explicitly say, you do not have the freedom to threaten or harass others. Okay? Uh, but then here we're saying we deplore any atmosphere of harassment and threat, when that clearly is not what was said in the original statement. And so I think here there is definitely a disconnect now between what the union is arguing for and what the general faculty body is actually arguing for. Okay? And so that might explain then sort of why this never became an issue within our own uh, university. Okay? And so now that basically, kind of tying that in then in terms of what's happening with our own union here at Acadia. So just over the time here that I've been at Acadia, what I've noticed is that there have been a number of people who've quit going to the meetings because either found them pointless or they got shouted down. Uh, there have been others who, were, who, who got kicked out and they said that the, it was because they were misrepresented. Uh, some have commented that when it comes to union meetings that that seems to be the place where they're expected to turn off their critical thinking skills. And then I've had some conversation with longtime members and some of the statements that, that they made that were offhand after the reading the letter seemed to have to take on a different meaning. Uh, so one longtime member commented to me that he felt that the union was no longer what it used to be. And another one commented to me that it seemed that the union was the one place that you could go to where you had a sense of community because that was a place where you could talk about anything, everything was free, you know, anything that was on your mind, it was there that you could talk about it. So there was a strong sense of community and solidarity. And he said that seemed to be in place until the union started getting heavily involved with the Canadian Association of University Teachers. Okay, so I don't want to make any cause effect kind of inferences, but there definitely seems to be something awry here. So basically as I was going through this process, it kind of told me, well, let's keep digging. Uh, so one major shift that's happened is that there's been a major shift in the political ideology of our professoriate. So, and it really started to take off uh, once I became a student in 1989. So back in 1989, uh, the ratio of the liberal, so basically the far left and the liberal, uh, versus the far right and conservative was a ratio of two to one. So now we fast forward to 2013-2014. So now that ratio, at least in this study done by Sam Abrams, is six to one. Uh, but depending on what parts of the country, it can be much larger. So in New England, I read a study uh, where they said that the ratio of liberal to conservative was 28 to one. Okay, so basically that's uh, an important issue because uh, depending on your uh, orientation, that's going to play, play a key role in what kind of research questions are asked and how you're now actually going to interpret the data. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Okay, and so I don't really have any data of what's happening here at Acadia, uh, but I do have a hypothesis on how we could actually test for this. Uh, so what I, what I would do if I could design the perfect study is get a representative sample of our Acadia uh, professoriates, so our faculty members, and ask them how they voted in the last provincial election that just took place May 30th of this year. Okay, and so we'd look at the distribution of how they voted in relation to what happened uh, with the results here. So what I have here is a political party and the percent of the popular vote. And so based on the trends that I've been noticing, the hypothesis that I would predict then, is that we'd have a far over-representation of the NDP and Green parties collectively, so those would be far over-represented within the Acadia faculty. Okay, a far under-representation of the progressive conservatives, so it's really hard to go around and find uh, people who are conservative. And then with the liberal, that's where I'd be on the fence, where I'm really not sure, so I put a question mark there. Uh, so in terms of uh, why that's a concern then is um, as this trend grows, uh, basically we, we're starting to put ourselves in a position where the university is starting to become irrelevant to the very society it's purporting to serve. And that is a very, I think, dangerous trend to happen. Okay, and so then the other thing that happens that now is that when you have a group that's going to dominate like that, uh, chances are they're not going to be just uh, benign in that position. So human nature being what, what it is, uh, when a group is dominant like that, it is going to start to assert its power. And so now we are starting to see these, um, uh, these power dynamics. So there's one study in 2010 reported by the American Association of Colleges and Universities. And so in that study, the, they found that only 17% of professors agreed that it was safe to hold unpopular points of view on campus. So that's from one study there. Uh, this is one from uh, the one done in 2012. Uh, so in this study, they sampled uh, the membership of the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. 
And so the sample that they got was about 266 members, and it was actually representative of the membership as a whole on the variables of gender, age, nationality, and position. Okay, and so then after that, the question they were asked was, uh, they were given a scale of how hostile is your work environment? So questions like uh, whether you feel reluctant to express your political beliefs to your colleagues because you fear negative consequences. So these are some of the questions that were asked on a scale of one to seven. Okay, and so the finding was that the conservatives gave a scale of a, a rating of about five, uh, the moderates around four, the real liberals about two. Uh, so here we are seeing that the conserved colleagues now are uh, you know, afraid to speak their minds. And would there actually be a rationale for that? And the answer from that study seems to be yes. Uh, so in the other part of the study, they asked uh, people, are you willing to discriminate now against a conservative colleague uh, in the context of, let's say, if you're reviewing a paper, are you willing to reject them if you know that they're conservative? So roughly about 20%, so 25% for a grant review, about 15% for inviting them for having a talk, and almost 40% for hiring. So basically, in terms of all these issues related to a career, uh, we can see now that there's clear discrimination that the, what people are actually willing to do. Okay, and so then when we have another thing that can happen then. Okay, so basically in terms of power dynamics, so where I'll be going to next then, is that for now what we're having then is that you have um, basically liberals and a far left. So with a far left, so basically with the liberals, you're going to have ones who are generally going to be okay with a change. We reach a change, we're happy with it. Uh, but then you're going to have the far left, and these are ones who are going to find oppression no matter where they look. Uh, so in the short term, their target's going to be the conservative colleagues. Uh, but then when you have this major bubble of groupthink like that, uh, then when there's only liberal colleagues left, basically, and that's what I'll show with the Evergreen College then, in that situation now, the left is going to eat itself. And that's a big danger that we have to worry about. Okay, so in terms of, uh, before I get there then, uh, what's going to happen then when you have um, someone, a, a groupthink dynamic like that, is that that's going to really change what kind of policies that you have. Uh, so I found it interesting then that we had the Google memo uh, con you know, issue this summer. And in all the reports I read in the media, they all seem to say that uh, the, the person who wrote the Google memo was for the most part correct, that it was scientifically accurate. So there's nothing really of uh, contention there. But it seemed to be a complete silence on university campuses about that, and that always struck me as odd. Okay, uh, probably the big thing that's um, um, that the, that seems to be a policy that seems to be really strongly, strongly endorsed is the mandatory unconscious bias or the diversity, and I put that in quotations, training. And it's because it's not really training that you get. It's not like there's a skill set that I didn't have before I went to the session, and now I suddenly have this training. So the rationale for that then is uh, in terms of premises then, is that we must break down society into its demographics and look at the percentages and distribution here, and that those percentages now have to be reflected at the institution. Okay, so that's the distinction now between equality of outcomes as opposed to equality of opportunity. So equality of opportunity is that if you apply and you have the skills, we'll take you and we're not going to look at issues like race or gender and things like that. Uh, but here is that you know, we have to look at these issues and they have to be the same. And what's interesting about that is even when trying to talk to colleagues who might be rational on any other issue, is that as soon as you bring this issue up, then suddenly the, the response is, it has to be this way, and it can't be discussed. And it just, I don't understand that disconnect where someone can be rational on all other fronts, but as soon as you bring up this one issue, uh, there's that immediate shutdown. Okay, uh, so now we have the ideas that we must have this distribution that's in the public that must be now seen within the institution. And the only explanation that can be considered is that it's some form of institutionalized bigotry. So it has to be racism, sexism, homophobia, or something like that. And you just wonder how it can be then, given that most of us are liberal to begin with, and so therefore we're going to you know, be completely opposed to any form of discrimination in the first place. So that's one that never made sense. Uh, so since we can't find any evidence on the explicit side, so then the assumption must be that this must be somehow implicit. And so that then becomes the justification then for these mandatory workshops. Uh, so when you go into the workshops, uh, you get all this biased information. So it's solely from one side, just you know, these um, evidence on the side of, let's say, sexism or racism or something like that. And it's as if the literature is somehow completely uniform and there's this uh, sense of consensus here. Okay, so you get the, a lot of biased information that's given there. 
And then afterwards, we have these equity initiatives, but there's little evidence that they actually work. So if you ask people just to participate in them voluntarily, our participation rates, I think, are a maximum 40%, with about 5% of people saying that they don't want to answer. So there's not much of a intake. So it's definitely not something that's coming from the membership saying this is something we demand. Uh, so that seemed to be something that's coming more from above. And so in terms of uh, whether they're effective or not, so it's not like we have any measurements of pre versus post, something to give us some data that these techniques actually work. Uh, so now because we haven't reached our equal outcomes, we don't have any evidence that these techniques work. So now the, uh, the, what happens is we decide we're going to have even more stringent issues that are going to focus even more stringently on race and gender that are incorporated into our hiring process. And so then that couples that we must have more of this equity training. Okay. And so then we might ask then, if, uh, if the, when the evidence that's presented like that is in such black and white terms, I think it's going to take very little now to counter that evidence. Uh, basically, if I want to say that the, the data are far more nuanced than what's actually being uh, presented to me. Uh, so this is now one study now looking at um, within the field of STEM. So in this uh, study here, uh, this was actually done as a real experiment where people were given profiles and then asked whether, you know, who they would hire. And actually here, they actually had a much stronger preference for women over men. So it was a two to one preference. So if you're going to say this, there is discrimination, it's actually discrimination against men, not discrimination against women. And so basically, this seemed to be across both genders. So it didn't matter if it was a male doing the, um, doing the, the reviewing or the female. And we seem to see across this basically across fields. So the only exception seemed to be male economists who are basically the only ones who are actually not showing a gender preference one way or another. And so in this study, they're actually saying that this is actually a good time for women to be going into STEM and we shouldn't be using such you know, doom and gloom scenarios. So I think with that starts to at least question the idea of that premise of the institutionalized sexism. Okay, and so in terms of the uh, the rationale then is um, the implicit bias and stereotype threat. And so the problem with both of those uh, literatures, so with the implicit bias, it's one that never always made a whole lot of sense to me. So there what happens is uh, we classify people uh, as, let's say, lazy versus hardworking. And what you find is that the reaction time is faster if you put someone black under lazy than hardworking. And so then that's uh, assumed that it must be racism somehow or you know, discrimination. Uh, but the other alternative that might make perfectly good sense is most of us are just familiar with these stereotypes. So it's just based on familiarity as opposed to me actually hating someone. And that could be an equally valid uh, alternative explanation. And you have no way of knowing which one is which based on just a reaction time. And so what's happening then with both this and the uh, stereotype threat then is uh, the main problems we see in those literatures is basically one is these uh, small effect sizes, failure to replicate. Uh, so basically when the effect happens, it's small. They often don't replicate. And uh, there's also what's known as publication bias. So that means that if you have this finding, you're more likely to get your results published than if you don't. And so now we ask about uh, implicit bias. Uh, so a recent article by J.C. Single basically says, I think the title says it, it says it all. It's maybe time to put this away. It's probably seen its best before date. Okay. Uh, so then the other is stereotype threat. So with stereotype threat, the the notion there then is that uh, if I'm a visible minority and I am I doing an exam and the exam heightens my uh, my feelings about my race, I'm going to do worse than 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 if you don't give me uh, these clues that heighten me about my race. Uh, but I think an easy alternative explanation for that is just uh, demand characteristics is, oh, I think I know you're doing this hypothesis, I picked up on it, and so then I, ha I can either act on that and confirm your hypothesis, or I could be someone who picked up on the hypothesis and then tried to disconfirm, and that could explain then some of the mixed results. And so what's rather interesting is that now I came across a study that's uh, soon to appear in psychological science, uh, where they actually found that female chess players were actually much better uh, than men. And so now here, so I use data from over 5.5 million games of international chess, uh, international tournament chess, and find no evidence of a stereotype threat effect. Okay, and so I think a lot of these basis now for having the uh, mandatory unconscious bias training are pretty minuscule to begin with. Okay, uh, so basically as we kind of go into now another round of collective uh, bargaining, we're at the stage where we're going to be having uh, conciliation soon. 
and, um, and a possible strike vote. And so for students, I mean, that's definitely something that you need to worry about. So I guess my advice to you is this is probably a good time to start asking pretty pointed questions from both the union and the board. So why is it that we're going on for these kinds of policies when the evidence is rather weak to begin with on that? And so I mentioned about an email I sent earlier in the term. So basically I had sent an open letter to the Acadia community asking pointed questions. Basically was about the survey that was sent out. So one problem was there was an online survey filled out by our faculty. And it could have been filled out multiple times. There was no way to screen for that. Uh, the questions that were asked were rather biased in one direction. And when it came to the written section, uh, we have no way of knowing that what was there, what they're actually reporting, uh, wasn't done with a clear lens. And then just that within the union meetings, I've been trying repeatedly to ask for different, uh, you know, to ask, propose different alternatives and not just having my responses ignored. So I think if you're a student, definitely you, this is a time to start asking really pointed questions from both sides. Uh, so from uh, your union members, like why are they advocating for a strike and whatnot. And I guess arguably even for the board, so why are they coming back to the table? So I did publish that letter and I still have not gotten a response. Uh, so that is, uh, I guess, an issue then to consider. Okay, and so in terms of where we're going and why I'm so strongly opposed to these measures is that in terms of where, where when we have a group now that's an extremely far left and they're um, basically starting to take over the campus. Uh, so basically what the far left is that they're going to see oppression no matter where they're looking. And so that's now leading to protests like what happened at the uh, University of Missouri. And so you can imagine now you have a scenario where uh, you have a protest um, um, a student reporter comes with a friend who has a camera, goes up to a professor, the professor says, you need to leave now, and the scene that ends up going viral is the professor saying, I'm going to need some muscle around here. Okay, so that's what happened in October 2015, so that's uh, Professor Melissa Click. And so basically, uh, at the campus, that's, that was what happened, so now we can fast forward to August 2017. So their first year enrollment is down 35% since those protests. Um, they have seven dorms that are being closed. In May, they announced that they would lay off 100 people and eliminate 300 more positions through retirement and attrition. And last year, they also reduced their library staff and cut uh, their cleaning uh, management job by about 50 positions. Uh, so it's not us as faculty members who are going to get hurt if something like that happens. It's going to be the ones who are the lowest paid to begin with, the ones who are the most vulnerable. Okay, and so now in terms of what I'll go to next is what happened at Evergreen State College uh, earlier this summer. Uh, so there are a lot of key players, so I'll just focus on a couple. So one was Brett Weinstein, uh, who is a professor of biology. Uh, the other is uh, the president, George Bridges. Okay, and so in terms of what happened is that when George Bridges arrived, uh, he decided we're going to implement an employment equity uh, council uh, across, the, across the university. And that was something that Brett Weinstein had strongly opposed and spoken out about. And so basically early on, uh, so what had happened was uh, when he raised concerns about that, he was called a racist and white supremacist in a meeting setting with no one really to stand for him. And so if you go to the Benjamin Boyce's website, so he's basically this uh, former poet who decided to become a YouTube critic and he's been digging into what's been happening with the emails and using freedom of information. And so some of the statements that were recorded and what he's had information to has been rather disturbing. So this is the president and what he said to uh, students uh, when it came to the issue of um, employment equity. Uh, bring them in, train them, and if they don't get it, sanction them. Okay, and so then other statements that uh, faculty members made were threats to equity must be eliminated, uh, unscrew institutional racism, we're inviting you to come along, we're going to do it, don't get it twisted, but we would like for you to join us. So it kind of gives you a flavor for what was happening on the campus um, in the two years prior to what happened this past summer. And so basically what kind of led to the events of uh, May uh, was that there was a tradition at Everdeen State College that was called the Day of Absence, Day of Presence. Uh, so what happened is that uh, the visible minorities or people of color uh, would voluntarily leave the campus for a day and then uh, that was just their way of kind of showing that you know we matter and when we're, when we're not around see what happens. Uh, but this particular year uh, what um, 
uh, the director of First Peoples Multicultural Advisory Services, Advising Services, demanded was that white people leave the campus for the day. And so Brett Weinstein put an email saying, it's one thing for a group to voluntarily absence themselves, but it's quite another for one group to demand that another group leave for a day and that we shouldn't go on the basis of our phenotype. We should be acting regardless of our skin color. Uh, so the day passed um, uneventfully, but then fast forward to uh, March, May 23rd, uh, so we think what had happened was, at that point, the students realized term was ending. If we're going to make our point, we have to do it now. And so I think the visual images speak volumes. So he was, uh, Brett Weinstein was just doing his class when suddenly this mob of 50 people was outside of his, um, outside of his um, class. And so he came out and he tried to have a discussion with them. And he asked a question. He asked, well, would you like to hear my answer? And their response was, no. Uh, so that was with what happened there. Uh, so this is the group heading over to the uh, president's office. So you have this group of about 100 students uh, up in the library. And let's see. And so the kinds of things you might have seen in the footage back then uh, was uh, one person saying, well, we have pizza here, but it's for people of color only. At one point, the president was speaking just the way I am normally. And people screamed out microaggressions and told them, stand like this. Uh, he wanted to go to the washroom, and he needed to be chaperoned for that. And so basically after that, things got out of control, and the school was actually closed for three full days. Okay? And I think the tweets speak volumes about what was happening there. So basically here, the uh, Brett Weinstein posting you know, that uh, the police um, let's say the police were forced to stand down by the president. So the president actually told the police not to do anything. Uh, the campus is unsafe. Uh, his wife had expressed uh, uh, concerns that maybe my husband is unsafe. And this was the response now from the, you know, the director of the Equity Council. I think that's the right name. Oh, Lord, could some white women at Evergreen come and collect? Uh, so that's his wife's racist. Okay? Uh, so that's what her response was. And then over here, then afterwards, that some of the students who are, who are on his side end up being doxxed. Okay, and this is probably not an image that we want for our campus here where you have students going around with baseball bats. Okay, and so then this was just utter mayhem. So now you have his brother, Eric Weinstein, saying, I never once in a million years dreamed that Fox would actually be, you know, the voice of reason over here. <laughs> okay, and that's... Yeah, and, uh, and it was curious that the liberal media was rather silent. So it took them a while, so it says here, basically about three weeks before there's any actual... Uh, you know, people coming to the campus to get coverage of this. So this was just completely surreal in terms of what had happened. Okay, uh, so now we can fast forward uh, to the meeting of the Board of Trustees. Okay, so we have uh, two people here who spoke about saying what had happened was utterly wrong. So of course, Brett Weinstein being the target of the protests. And the only student who spoke out saying that there was something wrong with the picture uh, was Mackenzie Kiger. And so she said that we're now so obsessed talking about race uh, that we're actually becoming racist here. But everyone else thought it was a great idea or that maybe they just hadn't gone far enough. So that is sort of the groupthink mentality that's happened here at Evergreen State College. And so if you actually look at the actual people, they're often the ones who, are, you know, who espouse the values of equity or diversity. Uh, repeatedly and talking about, you know, anti-oppression, how we need to really uh, encourage that. Okay, and so if you want, you can see more videos from the uh, Badger Pundit YouTube page, uh, just to actually see what had happened. He has a lot of um, uh, interesting videos there. And so basically, after the events, um, one of the people who was a professor at the university, who's now in the legislature, is saying that it's time to get funds to the university, so just make it a private university. If they're going to do anything, focus solely on STEM and forget all about the sort of the art side on campus. And so now, in terms of what's happening there, is they've had a 2.1 million budget deficit caused in part by this incident. So basically, they had this trend of declining enrollments to begin with. And this is just going to accelerate it further. And so what seems really bizarre now is after mentioning the hiring freeze, uh, the budget document states this. We must continue our efforts to make Evergreen a student-ready college. Our work in equity and inclusion is an important step in this process. So this is what they're actually putting in their own documentation. So despite everything that happened, they thought that this is actually a great idea and we must somehow continue on this path. Okay. So I think that's enough on that side. So I'll translate to something a little different.
Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys at this point to maybe close your eyes and take uh, one or two deep breaths. Okay. So now, whatever happens, I do not want you to think of a pink elephant. <laughs> or, okay. So okay. Did you now immediately think of a pink elephant after that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's step one. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you a story which I believe is from uh, the Cherokee First Nations tradition. I'm not sure if I'm citing it correctly, but uh, the, uh, I have the story to tell you here. Uh, so a grandfather is talking with his grandson, and he says that there's two wolves inside each of us which are always at war with each other. One of them is a good wolf, which represents things like kindness, bravery, and love. The other is a bad wolf, which represents things like greed, hatred, and fear. The grandson stops and thinks for a second, and then looks up at the grandfather and asks, well, grandfather, which one wins? And the grandfather quietly responds, the one you feed. Okay. Uh, so in terms of getting at the question then, instead of addressing hate speech, what we should be doing is addressing hate. And so what happens is the more you try to actually act on hate itself, the stronger it gets. I'll just close this. Okay. Uh, um, so that's why we shouldn't try to actually act on the hate itself, uh, because the more you try to suppress it, the stronger it gets. So that's what I was trying to do with the, uh, that example there with the idea of a thought suppression. And the same kind of thing happens with the chronic pain. So when people have a really chronic pain, uh, the more you try to actually fight your pain, the stronger it gets. And so that's why we use things like relaxation training, biofeedback, meditation. So how do we live with this unwelcome guest that's living inside our body? And so the answer is, at least it's not really more anecdotal evidence, but still, instead of the, the idea of what I'm trying to say here is, instead of trying to suppress the beast, feed the angels inside of all of us. And that this is hardly anything new. So anyone who's taken a first year psychology knows that when in the learning chapter, you're far better off trying to use positive reinforcement, develop the behaviors you want, than trying to suppress the ones that you don't want. And that seems to be the basis of uh, positive psychology and humanism as well. So it's hardly uh, reinventing the wheel. And there are some inspiring stories of what's actually happening. Uh, so this gentleman by the name of Daryl Davis, uh, he was interested in the question when it came to white supremacists. Why is it that you hate me when you don't even know me? Uh, so he kind of got interested in this quest. And so what he ended up doing was he decided, I'm actually going to uh, start to introduce myself to these white supremacists. And so over time, they started to get to know another. So his trick is, you can find, within five minutes, you can find something where there's going to be a common ground. And so use that and try to focus on your commonalities first. And so then over time, once you have a, a bond that you can build on, then maybe over time you can actually start to see each other as humans. And so what makes him particularly notable is that uh, 200 people of the KKK have given up their robes. And so you can watch that in the documentary that's called uh, Accidental Courtesy. So that's one that's uh, on Netflix these days. Okay, and so within the states, there are people now actually trying to heal. So you could imagine with the last election how really intensively divisive it became. And so in some of the towns, what they're doing is trying to get together with one another as a community. Uh, so in this article, they talked about how one half would talk about their experiences of what happened in the election, whereas the other half would just sit there and listen, and they're told explicitly no reaction whatsoever, not so much as even an eye roll. And then the other side would take turns. And so the idea is that they're trying to uh, take time to heal and get to know each other as humans. And so this is what's happening in, this, in the small towns. And we're seeing the same kind of thing in the, some of the big cities. And so here, um, what these women decided to do, so Tria and Justine, uh, was uh, create um, a context in which we could bring people together. And so they called it Make America Dinner Again. <laughs> so as a foodie, I quite endorse that one. Okay, so basically these actions are happening. And so basically what I'm trying to do in terms of proposal here is trying to go back now to the spirit of uh, Ruth Simmons. And so there's a group on Facebook that you can look up called the Students for Free Expression uh, that's been headed by Matthew Foldy. And so basically the proposals I'm putting here are well within the, the traditions that the, the, uh, their leadership. Okay, so basically I think uh, the one proposal I'd make then, and so I'm hoping that the student groups will take the lead on this. I wish, uh, is, um, so basically, is Samantha here tonight? Sorry. Samantha, our, our no, VP? She has class. Ah, darn. Okay, so basically I'm hoping then, okay, with the ASU then, if we can have this as a student-led, because obviously now at this stage I have a very 
vetted interest, so someone who is going to be completely hands-off removed. So basically with this is to get a conversation going, have people express their views, and basically the main process is that everyone has a voice, uh, but no one can actually take over the process. So that's basically what I'm trying to propose is have a committee, maybe starting with the ASU, and they can decide what faculty members to include. So someone who would be neutral uh, on this and to collect opinions. So one is basically uh, with our university, I've noticed that there's now a commitment to social justice. And it's at the point that now, if you're a coffee, it is actually now literally in your coffee because that's the only choice we do have now with our university having gone completely fair trade. Uh, so basically, I think we need to abandon this uh, commitment now to just pure social justice and try to treat activism the same way that we would uh, business when it comes and scholarship. So when it comes to scholarship, we don't want an influence of business. Same kind of way we do not want an influence of activism. So the idea is our goal is still to be the pursuer of the truth. And while there is an activist who can have voices on there, they cannot be the ones who dominate. So basically what I'm trying to do is have a model where we're making the size of the table bigger, having as many people there. So basically make the table bigger as opposed to having anyone excluded. Okay, and so much of what I have here comes from the Heterodox Academy. Uh, so basically it's a group of us who are uh, committed to trying to actually get viewpoint diversity back on campuses. And so what I'm proposing is that our university actually make a formal commitment to viewpoint diversity. And so one thing I'm recommending then uh, to help on that front is that our university implement a policy that explicitly states then that student groups are not going to be charged security fees if they're going to be bringing controversial speakers. And that maybe before we actually do anything like that, maybe have a policy in place. So if we're going to have activists, maybe there's a forum in which they can actually um, have their own counter session as an example. So something like that where people can tell, voice their concerns, but something other than shutting a speaker down. Okay. And so I mentioned the Chicago principles on academic freedom of expression. So I think adopting those is my one suggestion. And at the, basically at the core then is that I as a faculty member and the students have academic freedom and what I'm proposing is that we should have academic freedom for everyone. So, um, so I didn't include a long list because as soon as you exclude someone by mistake then of course they feel like they're part of the, not part of the, that they might have been excluded by, uh, by purpose. So basically I want to make sure that there's academic freedom for all, so including staff and not just as a, something that's just for faculty and students. Okay, uh, so one thing that the Heterodox Academy proposes is having some form of institutionalized disconfirmation. Uh, so one is maybe when you're having a job candidate come in, asking them when did they actually give an example of a time you actually showed um, tolerance for someone who had a very different point of view from, from you. So that could be one example. And so a strategy I came with is based on something that the Heterodox Academy did, which was trying to have liberal professors work with the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, so what my proposal is then that uh, we have a gender budget that focuses exclusively now on males, is that maybe we could have um, a research collaboration where we have groups that have really different points of views. Uh, they work on a problem as equals. Uh, so it's based on what we do in social psychology is have, instead of focusing on our differences, focus on this problem. And so that could be maybe our women and gender studies, economics departments, and researchers that would be endorsed from, let's say, the Canadian Association for Equality, which has the bad reputation of being known as just a men's rights group. So here, we'd have very different points of view working on a project that actually would be then a benefit to society. And I'm hoping that would help us um, do something about quelling my fear of what's happening with gender relations. And so when it comes to the idea of speech, instead of about shutting down, is how do we find a way of actually encouraging dialogue? So I've put in, instead of asking about, you know, suppression speech, uh, we take a different approach of which is focusing on the purpose of the speech. So we follow up with questions as well. Why you're saying that? What do you, what do you, what do you uh, hope to achieve here? And so I think that would get around some of the problems we have when it comes to, um, let's say someone's talking in class all the time. We have to hear from this one person. So instead of saying, you know, shut them down, we might ask them, well, you know, you do realize that when you talk that many times, you're actually working against your own goals. And so we're trying a different tactic. We're not suppressing the speech, but trying to guide them in a different direction. And so this way what I'm trying to propose is that what we do is we keep that line of dialogue opening and the long, and so the, as long as we're talking there's always that opportunity to reach common ground which we can't do as soon as we stop talking. 
Okay. And so in terms of just other ideas, is I think what's missing is sort of that art of debate. So maybe having uh, workshops for students and maybe even faculty about how to assert yourself in a classroom setting, how to debate. Uh, it's basically empower students how to actually defend their views. And the idea is if you hear a bad view, instead of just saying it's racist, let's come up with, let's overcome a bad idea with a good one. And so in terms of the broader conversations then, uh, just to have then, is that when we uh, focus on our differences, do we lose out on our own common goals? So the question is, are we actually losing our humanity when we focus so much on what we call the identity politics? And so then last is, can we do a better job of working collectively as a community uh, to work on our shared goals while at the same time still maintaining our individuality and maintaining that difference? Okay. So on that note, I'll thank you for your time.